Hello and welcome to Chapter 17, Atmospheric Science and Air Pollution. So Chapter 17 happens to be one of the more dense and uh, important chapters that we're going to go over in this book. So in this video, uh, even though we're talking about some very, very important things, I'm going to try to keep it not quite as intimidating as it could be. Um, but really, you're going to want to have to understand air pollution and atmospheric science by the end of this because these are all very important topics. Okay, so let's just start off by talking very generally about atmosphere. So here are the main layers. We have the troposphere, the stratosphere, the mesosphere, and the thermosphere. So as we're going to start talking about ozone a little later in this video and a little later, later in the chapter, excuse me, um, a device that my teacher taught me to help me remember where ozone is good and where it's bad is this. Ozone is good up high, meaning the stratosphere, and bad nearby, meaning the troposphere. So if you have ozone in the troposphere, it's pollution, but if you have it in the stratosphere, it's a protective shield. But again, we're going to get into that a little later in the video. So first, let's look at atmospheric pressure. So something to remember about atmospheric pressure is that it's going to decrease with altitude. Okay, also the atmosphere is responsible for changes in the weather and the climate. Let's uh, make a differentiation between weather and climate first. So weather is an atmospheric condition over a short period of time versus climate, which is an atmospheric condition over a larger area and over a longer period of time. So within weather, there are a few key terms to look over. In simple terms, there is a general front, and then there's a warm and cold front, as well as high and low pressure systems. Okay, now let's discuss something known as a thermal inversion, which is a very important thing to understand. So here we have a normal pattern and an inversion pattern. So as you can see in the normal pattern, you have warm air on the bottom, then cool air, and then cooler air, so there's a nice flow. However, during a thermal inversion, you have cool air, trapped by warm inversion air with cool air again on top. So let's break this down. Take a city such as LA or Denver. These cities are surrounded by mountains and so they're in a valley of sorts. So basically what happens in this valley is this dense cool air is stuck uh, closer to the ground, trapped in by this warm inversion layer of air, which is thus trapped in by this cool air. So basically what happens is this creates photochemical smog, which we're gonna also talk about later in this video. But all of this pollution is trapped, and so that's why you get like a thick, smoggy haze in somewhere like L.A. Okay, let's move on to wind. So wind patterns happens to be one of the more confusing topics in environmental science, just because there are so many different ways that wind move. So basically, we're just going to go over it briefly in this video, but your book is a good resource if you need more depth. Here's the simple way that wind flows around the globe. Basically, on top you have the polar easterlies, then the westerlies, trade winds, the equator, more trade winds, the westerlies, and the polar easterlies, again. Uh, and then also, around the equator here, there is something known as Hadley cells, which is a term that you should know as well. And again, wind is very confusing, and it's kind of hard to describe in this video, but again, your book is a very, very good resource, so you can refer to that section if you have any questions. Okay, so now let's take a look at outdoor air pollution. So uh, when looking at outdoor air pollution, there are both natural causes and anthropogenic causes. And if you haven't uh, become familiar with that word anthropogenic yet, it's basically just a fancy sciencey way of saying human caused. So let's look at a natural pollutant. That could be, for example, a volcano or a, a fire. So those are creating smoke and a lot of soot going into the air, but they are natural causes. Uh, compared to an anthropogenic cause, which could be anything from uh, pollution from factories or driving cars or really anything. Okay, so now let's break up the difference between a primary and a secondary pollutant. So a primary pollutant is something such as carbon monoxide that comes directly from the source. Whereas a secondary pollutant uh, occurs when a primary pollutant reacts with something else in the troposphere. Now let's take a quick look at Clean Air Acts. So there were two Clean Air Acts that we're going to go over, uh, the one in 1970 and the one in 1990. And basically what they both discussed is uh, they put limits on uh, levels of emissions. Uh, and they built on each other. So the one in 1970 was a little less um, restrictive, the one in 1990 was a little more restrictive, and it built from there. And basically what these Clean Air Acts uh, lead into is the more recent updates, such as a carbon tax and a cap-and-trade system, which we're going to talk about a few videos from now, but they are very important. 
Okay, so now let's take a look at uh, criteria pollutants. So if you go to page 472, uh, there are six criteria pollutants listed. Uh, look over those in the book and read the small paragraph explanations on them because they are very solid, so they're not really worth repeating in this video. So I would just go to page 472 and look those over. Okay, so now let's take a quick look at VOCs and industrializing nations. So a VOC is essentially a carbon-containing chemical used in and emitted by vehicles, as well as many household items. So VOCs are within the top six most dangerous and common air pollutants. Okay, so this leads us into industrializing nations and their connection to air pollution. So basically, as a nation, de as a nation develops and uh, attempts to expand their economy, they prioritize growth over expensive environmentally friendly options. Therefore, even though developed nations are reducing emissions, it's hard to make a huge impact into air pollution as developing nations are throwing out all these crazy amounts of emissions. However, things such as scrubbers, which are placed on smokestacks, and take out many toxins uh, from smoke are proving to be the best option at this point for reducing emissions. Okay, so this carries us over into smog. So there are basically two main types of smog, uh, the first of which is industrial smog. An industrial smog is formed uh, when coal or oil are burned. So when either of these two things are burned, part of them uh, are entirely combusted, which makes CO2, part are partially combusted, making CO, and the last part isn't combusted, which makes soot. So from there, sulfur dioxide plus soot and other chemicals produce this smog. The next type of smog that we're going to look at is photochemical smog. And photochemical smog is formed when sunlight triggers a reaction between primary pollutants and normal atmospheric compounds, which oftentimes yields tropospheric ozone, which as I said earlier is that bad ozone that's low down. So basically, uh, this could happen during morning traffic when the sunlight is hitting all that uh, VOC pollution, and this could form tropospheric ozone, which serves as a pollutant uh, when it's in the troposphere. Okay, now let's take a look at CFCs and ozone depletion. So an important thing to know in environmental science is that uh, ozone depletion is not actually connected to global warming. It's connected to CFC production, and they're entirely different. So there's not a hole uh, forming in the ozone because of global warming and climate change, but instead because of CFCs. So a CFC is basically a chlorofluorocarbon, which uh, are man-made and used to be in hairsprays, refrigerators, air conditioner, cooling fluid, etc. However, they're not, they're not used anymore. So there was something known as the Montreal Protocol, which phased CFCs out of production. However, chlorine forms with ozone molecules, and due to the reaction, continually restarts the process over and over again. So even though we aren't releasing any more CFCs into the air, the same level of damage continues to occur because CFCs aren't leaving the stratosphere, which is causing a thinning of the ozone overall uh, all around the world, but more specifically, uh, it's getting the thinnest over Antarctica. So this thinning of the level of ozone has a few main problems, uh, the most important of which is UV levels rising. So without a protective ozone layer uh, absorbing those UV rays, there is no protection from them. So basically that just means some birds are going to be getting worse and these UV rays are going to come in at uh, unforeseen levels that we haven't ever experienced before. And uh, we can't really do anything about it until these CFCs work their way naturally out of the ozone. So we're just kind of waiting to see what will happen here. Okay, so on the topic of air pollution, let's talk about acid deposition. Basically, think of acid deposition as a acid rain, which I'm sure you've all heard of before. But basically, how that forms is when sulfur dioxide and nitric oxide are morphed into sulfuric acid and nitric acid. Then they fall to earth as precipitation. Basically, this is bad because it contaminates soil, water, and just kills ecosystems because it's acidic uh, rain essentially falling onto the ground. Uh, this has begun to be counteracted by things such as like the Clean Air Act and other policies against uh, air pollution, but really uh, it hasn't been solved and it won't be solved until we reduce those levels of air pollution. Okay, so the book also goes into a description of some indoor air pollutants, uh, such as cigarette smoke and radon. So we just discussed these toxins a couple of videos ago, so I'm not going to make a whole slide on them, but do keep in mind that indoor air pollution is just as big of an issue as outdoor air pollution. Okay, conclusion. So air pollution is detrimental and has lasting effects. 
But until green energy becomes inexpensive and more practical, it's going to be hard to truly counteract. Okay, so uh, in next chapter, chapter 18, we're going to look at the biggie, the one everyone's been waiting for, global climate change. Okay, so thank you, and I'll see you next time.